Welcome to AJC Europe Connects and Advocacy Anywhere, AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. The Port of Beirut explosion in August brought the world's attention to the political, humanitarian, and economic crises in Lebanon. Following the explosion, many observers began questioning Hezbollah's role and legitimacy within the country. AJC has long drawn attention to the security threat that this terror group poses not only to the Middle East, but around the globe. Over the past 20 years, Hezbollah, by its own public admission, has been able to supplant the Lebanese army and create a state within a state. The recent domestic crises have allowed the terror group to exercise its malign influence throughout the Middle East in an increasingly uninhibited un un manner. In Europe, Hezbollah and its supporters have not only carried out terror attacks, but raised and laundered money, stored weapons, and trafficked drugs. Only a few weeks ago, U.S. State Department Coordinator for Counterterrorism, Ambassador Nathan Sales, revealed to AJC that Hezbollah moved significant stockpiles of ammonium nitrate through Belgium, France, Greece, Italy, Spain, and Switzerland. For these reasons, AJC today once again called upon the European Union to designate Hezbollah a terrorist organization in its entirety by taking out a full page ad in the Wall Street Journal. In order to discuss Hezbollah's activities in Europe in greater detail, we are pleased to welcome Matthew Levitt, director of the Washington Institute's Counterterrorism and Intelligence Program. Mr. Levitt will speak about the Institute's newly released Hezbollah Worldwide Activity Map the largest database of open source information about Hezbollah's illicit activities worldwide. Joining today's conversation is Simone Rodan Benzaken, General Man Manager of AJC Europe. After we hear from Simone and our esteemed guest, we will take your questions. You may submit your questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Simone, you and Mr. Levitt have the floor. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, I would like to welcome our viewers around the world who are with us today, literally around the world, because I think we have many people from both sides of the Atlantic. Um, it is my pleasure to be with our good friend, Matthew Levitt, today. Uh, Matt has visit our, visited our different uh, offices in Europe um, for many, many years. Uh, a concept that now seems um, somehow very distant. Um, so I'm happy that until we were able to welcome Matt uh, once again uh, in Paris, in Brussels, in Berlin, uh, we can take advantage of technology and pretend he is with us here today. Uh, so as you will see and hear over the next hour, Matt is really one of the most serious and most knowledgeable experts on the topic of Hezbollah. Uh, in the first 10 minutes, Matt will present some elements of his Hezbollah worldwide activity map that Eric just mentioned, mostly focusing on elements uh, in Europe and followed by some questions from me and then from the rest of uh, the audience. So Matt, without further delay, the floor is yours. Uh, Simone, thank you so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to be, be here uh, with you today. And I really do look forward to the opportunity to come back and visit uh, in Paris and Berlin and Brussels and your various offices. I, I want to make sure to thank in advance uh, Anne-Sophie and uh, Brigitte and, and Shani and Eric and everybody for making this possible. Um, let me jump right into it so that we have as much time as possible for, for conversation. And I'm just going to share my screen so you can see uh, the map. Uh, Simone, can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, this is the landing page for the map uh, with a lot of uh, various different types of multimedia, uh, essays, videos, tutorials. I just want to point out that the introductory essay is available here in multiple languages from Arabic and Farsi, uh, German, uh, Spanish, and of course, you see it here uh, in French. Um, but we'll close out of that. You can explore this at your leisure. This is a free and public resource available at washingtoninstitute.org. There are a couple of maps of Hezbollah activity around the world that exist. One was put out by the State Department, it's really more of a list, 10 incidents over the course of 30 years in Europe. That just upset me because there's many, many more than 10 incidents. Uh, and uh, the, another one is uh, um, um, a map that was put out by the Nas U.S. National Counterterrorism Center with about 49 entries around the world. And again, 
it's a nice start, but there are many, many more. If you look in the top left-hand corner, we're updating this all the time. So we tell you at any given time how many events. We don't have 49 events in here. We have 1,218 events. Uh, and we are still adding events all the time. <clears throat> uh, and we tell you when we've last done that. So let me just show you quickly how the map works. Uh, and then navigate the map to show you a little bit about Hezbollah's activity around the world. Um, in Lebanon, uh, in Europe and France in particular, um, and, and more broadly, and then we'll open up the conversation. So unlike any of the other tools that are out there, uh, this has several functions that make it unique. First of all, it's completely navigable. So you can go anywhere you want, uh, wherever your interests are, and you can focus in on, on that location. Uh, HSC Paris is hosting this, so we'll focus on France. And you can click on, on any one of these entries and you can get um, uh, either that particular entry, if there's just one entry in that location, or you can get a drop down menu of all the entries associated with that location. So for example, if we go to Paris, we'll get a drop down menu of all the entries that are either in Paris or since Paris is the capital, associated with France, an entry for which we don't have another location in France or uh, has to do with, with France more generally. A, a French citizen is a victim of Hezbollah or as we'll see happens, uh, a French citizen is a Hezbollah operative. And you can see there are a, a lot more than uh, one or two entries uh, for Europe, in this case, just, just for Paris. Um, you, can also, um, you, you can also navigate this by time. And so if you look at the bottom of the screen, there is a, a navigation bar. You can click on any one of these entries and it will tell you what it is. You can uh, navigate the bar and tell, look, I just wanna know uh, what's been going on from 2005 to 2009, and it will uh, adjust the map uh, accordingly. Uh, and you can also uh, click on specific years. So for example, 2008, and get a drop down menu of all of the incidents that have happened um, in, the, in, the, in the map in 2008. And this is a really good uh, example, 2008. Um, it's one that actually uh, happened because if you, uh, if you think back to 2008, uh, at one point, I got a call from uh, a particular law enforcement agency asking, why are we seeing a, a sharp uptick in Hezbollah activity, in recruitment to Hezbollah in general, in recruitment from within Hezbollah to Hezbollah's Islamic Jihad organization or its external uh, security organization, Unit 910, those are all names for Hezbollah's terrorist wing, around second quarter 2008. And the answer, of course, is if you click on this entry here, you'll be reminded that Imad Mugnia the founder, one of the founders of Hezbollah and the founder and longtime leader of uh, Hezbollah's um, terrorist wing was killed in what we now know as a joint US-Israeli operation in February uh, 2008. So for any given entry, just to use this as an example, we'll have a picture or in this case a video, we will have a narrative which gets edited very, very carefully. And then we have two other sections. One is a see also section where we do the homework for you and we point you to other entries uh, that would be uh, of interest to you. In this case, um, Imad Bugnia was tied to many. Uh, and this, this particular one doesn't yet. As I said, we're still updating all the time. Uh, but um, if, you, uh, if you go to uh, 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 other entries, uh, for, let's just take one randomly. Rawi Sultan is recruited in Morocco. Uh, we have a section on documents. Uh, in this case, it's a document from the Israel Security Agency, their domestic service. If you click on that, we, we provide you the document and it's downloadable, uh, et cetera. So this is both the largest collection and also the largest data set of, of documents uh, of any kind um, on, on Hezbollah. Aside from being able to navigate the map and navigate the chronology bar, you can of course search um, by uh, keyword search, which we'll do in a moment. And then most interesting, or at least for me, because it was the most work, is uh, we've coded all the entries by category. So you'll look, you'll see entries are either dark blue, light blue, or pink. Dark blue uh, refers to plots and attacks. Uh, light blue is finance and logistics. And pink is kind of terrorism actions. And you can click on any one of these primary codes or any of these secondary codes, and you can search just for those entries. So remember I told you that the National Counterterrorism Center has an entry, with a map of 49 entries. Even if we only look at the plots and attacks, not anything else, as I scroll through the list of plots and attacks, you will see it's a lot more than 40, forgive me, it's taking so long, a lot more than 49 entries of just the plots and attacks uh, around the world over time. But of course, you could also search by types of attack and finance and logistics. You could, if you want to research how they use fake identification, finance, 
Uh, the myth of distinct wings, we'll talk about that as we discuss the EU designation issue. Pre-operational surveillance, smuggling, weapons procurement, you can, you can search all these, all these different things. We're about to be adding some other capabilities, including a drop-down menu to be able to search by country. So if you'll allow me now, let me show you, uh, just navigate by uh, keyword search to take you a few, uh, a few entries to uh, get to a few points I think are, are really uh, useful uh, to make. And I like to start with things that are really early in the Hezbollah timeline. Um, and I like to highlight some of the declassified intelligence we've been able to include in here. It's a significant amount of declassified CIA material, FBI material, and others, some Europol, et cetera. Here is a February 1987 uh, declassified, um, redacted, but declassified CA report. We give you uh, the relevant section here. You can just click on it. But of course, we give you, we give you the whole document. All these CIA, FBI documents are, are available. And this is a document on Lebanon's ports, gateways for instability and terrorism, written in February 1987. What's amazing is that the point, or one of the points of this paper, 1987, is that Hezbollah at the time did not have access to the port of Beirut. Other terrorist groups did, mostly the alphabet soup Palestinian groups resident in Lebanon at the time. So much remains the same. The ports are still uh, significantly uh, open, uh, unregulated and available for misuse and abuse by corrupt politicians, but also terrorist groups. And so much has changed. None of those smaller Palestinian groups are in control of the port of Beirut or other ports in Lebanon today but Hezbollah uh, absolutely is. Uh, and just to uh, demonstrate that this is not something I'm saying uh, with any type of cavalier um, uh, statement, if you go, for example, to the State uh, Treasury Department's designation of Wafik Safa, who is the head of Hezbollah's main security organ, uh, designated uh, last year in 2019, um, they note in particular uh, that Safa has exploited Lebanon's ports and border crossings to facilitate Hezbollah's smuggling of contraband, including drugs and weapons, along with the travel of Hezbollah members through the ports. That includes, but it's not limited to, uh, the seaport uh, in Beirut. And so there's a lot of continuity over time, as much as there is uh, a lot of change. Um, Hezbollah is lots of different things, and anybody who tells you otherwise is being overly simplistic. Hezbollah is a political organization and it involve, is it engaged in, in social welfare activity in Lebanon, but that is not all it does. It is also a militant organization, uh, better armed, better funded, more missiles under its control than the Lebanese armed forces, indeed more missiles than most countries. Uh, it's an international criminal organization and it is an international terrorist organization. Those who say it's just a terrorist or military organization, they have it wrong, it engages in other activities. But Hezbollah itself is the one time and time and time again that insists there is no distinction between these wings. They leverage all of these wings for all of their efforts. They will leverage the military wing for their political effort. They will leverage the political wing for their terrorist and military effort. And I just wanna uh, highlight uh, Salim Ayash, who was recently convicted by the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Um, unless you think I'm only pointing my finger at, at Europe, given that this is a conversation with AJC Paris, Salim Ayash uh, holds a U.S. passport. This is an international problem set. Um, but what's interesting is that after the uh, tribunal um, decision came out, um, US so that was for the murder of of, uh, of Rafik Hariri. Uh, uh, for the murder of Rafik Hariri, um, and he is still on trial in a second trial in the special tribunal for the murder of several other Lebanese uh, politicians. Um, it was revealed that he is part of Hezbollah's external security organization, Unit 121. Unit 121, to be simple and blunt, is Hezbollah's assassination unit. So Hezbollah will leverage its military if there are politicians not to its liking, not to its favor, getting in the way to benefit its political activities. It will use its politicians, as I'll show you, to benefit its terrorist wing. And therefore, the myth that these are distinct wings is just that a myth. And it's one that sometimes we in the West perpetuate out of a political convenience, but it's one that Hezbollah officials uh, themselves laugh at. Now, I think it's important to mention that there is a long history that most people uh, are not aware of, of Hezbollah targeting French interests. I am not going to go through all of that. Uh, yesterday, I published a report that gets into this in, in some detail. I'll point you to that in a moment. But I just wanna show you not 
from one of the examples that anybody would likely know about, not the blowing up of the uh, French uh, military barracks in Beirut, not the targeting of the French embassy in Beirut with RPGs, rocket, rocket propelled grenades, not the assassination of the defense attache, not the 1985-86 bombings in Paris, <clears throat> and many, many more. But it turns out, according to CIA reporting from 1984, that Hussein Moussaoui, who was the head of Islamic Amal, which was becoming the head, the core of what we now know as Hezbollah, was negotiating um, a deal with the international terrorist Carlos the Jackal, because Carlos had been, uh, was very angry with France for his own reasons. He was targeting French interests in North Africa, in Europe, and Hussein Moussaoui also had an interest in targeting French interests for a variety of reasons. We can get into it if you like. But there's a tremendous amount of information that has not been publicly available that we are making public now. And the way I put this is to, to borrow a phrase from a Hezbollah terrorist handler himself, Fadi Kassab, when he was handling a terrorist operative in the United States. I'll show you this example in a moment, Ali Karani. Ali Karani asks him one time too many about Hezbollah activities in Cyprus, in Bulgaria, in Thailand. And Fadi Kassab says to him, no, don't ask those questions. The golden rule, he says, of the Islamic Jihad organization is the less you know, the better. What we're doing here with this map, with this conversation, with this webinar, is we're breaking this golden rule and we're making some of this public. The reason this is so important is because Hezbollah does engage in public activities, the political, the social, and they go to great lengths through their propaganda machine, their television, their radio, their print, their online presence to make that public. They go to no less length to hide the illicit activities that they are uh, engaged in. And a lot of that activity is engaged in uh, places uh, like, like Europe. Um, so, um, Eight, one second, oh, coming up, here we go. So if we consider, for example, um, the case of Iman Kobesi and Joseph Asmar, um, this is a great example that lets me demonstrate for you the, the spider lines, as we call them, that we can put in here to demonstrate the transnational links of Hezbollah's activity, excuse me. Um, Iman Kobesi and Joseph Asmar are running a massive money laundering, narco trafficking international network out of Paris and, and, and Lebanon. Eventually, Iman Kobesi is lured to the United States and is arrested in Atlanta and a US uh, federal agent undercover operation. In close cooperation with French counterparts, the same day French authorities arrest Joseph Asmar in Paris. Uh, part of this was the product of a joint operation. In fact, Drug Enforcement Administration agents from the United States engaged in, a, in, a, in an undercover operation meeting with Iman Kobesi in Paris. The amount of information that this case revealed about the ease and comfort with which Hezbollah is laundering money through Europe in general, but France in particular, was amazing. And it led to a series uh, of other uh, operations, some of them uh, you may be uh, familiar with, for example, uh, Operation Cedar. Uh, Operation Cedar led to the uh, arrest, uh, trial, and conviction in France of Mohamed Nur ad a very senior Hezbollah operative. Uh, a second Hezbollah operative who unfortunately was put under house arrest pending trial and fled the country and is now a fugitive of French justice because he was arrested on money laundering charges, uh, which are not considered a violent crime in France. He was put under house arrest and was able to flee. Yet another reason why a general designation of all of Hezbollah would be useful if he had been arrested for engaging in money laundering in service of a designated terrorist organization, he likely would have been detained and would not have fled. Um, this led to uh, the exposure of a transnational money laundering operation involving the movement and laundering of drugs from um, South America through Europe, uh, sorry, through Africa into France. And then maybe uh, 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 no less significant is the use of um, hairdressers and all kinds of other small stores um, in, in, in uh, France, a hotel in Belgium, in the Netherlands and Germany to buy things like gold, watches, and jewelry to smuggle these uh, back to Lebanon to get the money back. And then the last example I wanna give you about Europe in general and, and, and France in particular is the, the fairly recent uh, designation of Salah Asi, uh, just one of several dual Lebanese French citizens, prominent businessmen, in this case with um, fancy addresses, both in Beirut uh, and in Paris, uh, providing very, very critical uh, financial support 
uh, illicit illegal financial support through criminal activity uh, for Hezbollah using their companies in Africa, um, in, in Lebanon, uh, and their connections uh, in Paris. Uh, the, the next point I want to make is more generally about Hezbollah's use of dual nationals. Salaf Asi is one, and they use these for financial support, but they use these for operations as well. And because we are talking about um, because we were talking about France, I want to focus on uh, some cases of dual French Lebanese operatives. So most people are aware that there have been two uh, cases now of Hezbollah activity in Cyprus. The one case where they've actually succeeded in blowing something up, unfortunately, in Burgas, Bulgaria. You might not be aware there were two cases in Thailand, uh, cases in Panama, in Peru, in the UK, Nigeria, a whole bunch of other places. But in four of these cases, at least, French citizens were deployed as Hezbollah operatives. Hussein Yacoub was actually a, um, a dual Lebanese Swedish operative, but as part of his operational training, he was sent to Lyon to liaise with Hezbollah operatives there, whose identities we don't know, to pick up some packages uh, from them to deliver something to them uh, as part of his training for the Cyprus plot. But then, um, in the second half of that plot, Hussein Yacoub was involved in conducting surveillance of Israeli tourists getting off their tourist bus in Cyprus. The second half of that plot was the stockpiling of ammonium nitrate in these ice packs uh, in a safe house uh, in Cyprus. And it turns out that when Hezbollah wanted to purchase the safe house, which you do for operational security purposes, and there's no rent, etc., you actually own the property, they used a cutout. They used a professor, Jamal Juma'a who was a professor at a university in Lyon at the time, a dual Lebanese French citizen. He has fled uh, France. He's the subject of an international arrest warrant and is believed to be in Lebanon today. And he purchased the house for approximately 350 euro, which according to Cypriot police is well above the market value. Now, there are many other cases like this. We know, of course, that the actual bomber in uh, Burgas, Bulgaria uh, was um, a, uh, a French citizen, Al Husseini. What you may not know, uh, is that his father, according to Bulgarian prosecutors, revealed just a couple of weeks ago, is also a Hezbollah supporter, specifically providing financing, not to Hezbollah writ large, not to its hospitals or schools, but to Hezbollah's uh, external uh, security organization. Now, again, I don't want you to think that I'm, I'm, I'm just focusing on, on France and on Europe, and these things don't happen uh, all over the world. Uh, they absolutely do. Uh, and we've had a, uh, a particularly interesting case uh, here in the United States um, involving Ali Karani, Samar al Debek, and Alexi Saab, three Islamic Jihad organization operatives who've been arrested. Ali Karani has been convicted, the other two not yet. They all did surveillance in the United States. Uh, Samar Debek also did surveillance in Thailand and Panama. Um, Ali Karani did it at the airport in JFK in New York and in Pearson, but Ali Karani also, once he got a U.S. passport, was sent to Guangzhou, China, where there's the world's largest factory where these ice packs using ammonium nitrate are made for the specific purpose of negotiating a discount deal uh, for, the purpose, for the purchase of these ammonium nitrate ice packs. So there's a lot more that we could talk about in terms of these attacks around the world. I just want to end uh, with this, and I can give you more examples as we have our conversation, uh, if you like. Europol, in its last terrorism threat assessment report, uh, noted that there have been several cases of Hezbollah money laundering and other criminal activities throughout Europe, and it's very difficult to prosecute these. Why? Because of the partial designation of Hezbollah. Because under this, under this current situation, you need to prove that the money actually goes to the terrorist and military wing. Today, Hezbollah is under more pressure than it's ever been under because at home, not only because of its use of human shields, uh, you know, burying missile components in public places and uh, urban places in, 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 in Beirut for undermining the financial system, for assassinating politicians and law enforcement they don't like, but because they are de facto the enforcers of the corrupt political system of which they are a part. They're not the, they're not the sum total of it, but they're the enforcers of this corrupt system. Uh, President Macron called them out, and I think that that signals that there's potentially an opportunity now uh, for a shift in um, uh, French thinking on Hezbollah. And I think that that allows us to give uh, opportunity for a conversation like this about Hezbollah activities around the world and Europe in particular, threatening European interests in and beyond Europe. 
and about this issue of the myth of the wings. So let me stop there and, and engage in conversation and Q&A with you. I, I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I, I've I've gone through the the map myself, and I encourage all of all of you really to to go through it in detail. It's it's really fascinating. You can dip, dig deep and and go wide. Um, it's really fascinating, um, Matt. My first question is, uh, you have engaged for years uh, with European diplomats and also with French diplomats in particular. And I want to be very clear that um, on the issue of Hezbollah, of course, uh, France has really been a voice within the European Union obstructing to some extent uh, mm -hmm. the listing of Hezbollah in, as a terrorist organization uh, in its entirety. Now, uh, you've heard the arguments, but I want, to, I want to give you the opportunity to respond to some of those arguments, uh, which, which, are, which are important to hear, I think. Um, French diplomats, and European diplomats, um, I I'll put a few in front of you um, and, and see which one you want to pick or if you want to pick all of them. The first one we hear a lot is, is for not listing Hezbollah as a terrorist organization in its entirety, is it would destabilize Lebanon uh, since, Lebanon, since Hezbollah is also part of the political process. Um, that's the first one. The second one is the listing would prevent us Europeans from talking to Lebanon. Um, from engaging with Lebanon. And, uh, and that's, of course, uh, for us, uh, very important. And, and the last one is one that we've seen a lot over the last couple of weeks, um, in particular on social media, uh, uh, in the French sphere, is basically a ban doesn't do much other than sort of making you feel good about yourself. How do you respond to such arguments? So thanks for the, attack, uh, for the, uh, for the question. Um, Look, uh, I've had, uh, you, you and I have had together in several instances this conversation with French officials many, many times over the years. Um, and I think it's important to, to start by noting that a, a designation is no panacea. A designation would not solve our problems, but I think it would be a very good start. And one reason it would be a good start is because it is not a nuclear option. Uh, one, one issue that you didn't mention that sometimes French officials point is to, would there be reprisal attacks, whether in France or targeting French soldiers against in, in UNIFIL uh, in, in southern Lebanon. And uh, my answer to that is that there have been many, many designations of Hezbollah by many countries, many multilateral organizations, the organization overall, individuals, front companies, and there's never been a reprisal attack. Um, last year, France shut down uh, 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 an Islamic uh, association in northern France for its ties to Hezbollah. Um, there was no re reprisal for that. Uh, it's very, very unlikely. I do not think it would destabilize Lebanon. But I think quite to the contrary. I think it would be a step in the right direction towards stabilizing Lebanon. And the answer is the simple. It, the, the reason for that is simple psychology. Um, Hezbollah takes a step and it waits to see how you're going to react. If you don't react, this is okay. That step's, step's good. I'll take another step. What we need to do is find ways to demonstrate to Hezbollah that there are consequences to its actions, that it cannot, as Macron recently said, it cannot expect to be treated as a legitimate political actor while it is picking fights with its neighbors on its own as a, as a sub-state actor, not as the Lebanese government. Lebanese, the Lebanese government doesn't have a say in this. Um, when it is doing things out of its own and Iran's interests in Lebanon that put Lebanon at risk, whether it's building rockets in urban centers, undermining the Lebanese financial system, uh, assassinating uh, Lebanese politicians and law enforcement, we can go on and on. So uh, there's an element of making them feel that they can get away with these types of activities. And a nice way to do it is doing something that won't cause a significant reprisal. The issue of there's a discomfort, and I, I actually share it a little bit with, with designating as a terrorist group an element that at least in part is duly elected. I understand that. People can vote for anybody they want, but there are consequences to that. Years ago, Austria elected someone who was uh, tied to the Nazis and they were uh, ostracized for quite a few years. Um, there are consequences to, to this type of behavior and people can vote for whoever they want, but it doesn't mean that if you get voted into office, you have a, a get out of jail free card. Someone robs a bank and is arrested and says, no, no, I'm a local councilman, but you can't arrest me. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. Um, the next thing to point out is that this in no way under uh, European Union uh, designation authority, common position 931, CP 931, in no way would this prevent any type of engagement with Lebanon, nor would it even prevent engagement with Hezbollah. French officials, European officials could continue to engage with Hezbollah, Hezbollah parliamentarians. They could meet with the head of the group, Hassan Nasrallah himself. CP 931 calls a spade a spade. 
it, it, it says we acknowledge that you engage in terrorism and it has an, uh, an asset forfeiture, uh, a, a financial freeze authority. That's it. It doesn't ban travel, doesn't ban meetings of any kind. As for the ban being effective, I think, A, as I said, I think drawing a line in the sand sa saying, look, there are consequences and we will, we're not afraid to, to, to tell you that we know you're doing what you're doing is important. But as Europol itself reported, as I mentioned in this last report, there are tangible, tactical, practical um, issues that are complicated by the fact that there isn't an EU-wide ban. That's not me saying it, it's European law enforcement saying it, which includes French law enforcement, uh, of course. So I, I, I've had these conversations over many years. I don't think they hold water. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, this is a political issue. I, I know it is. I've had this conversation publicly and privately. And when you talk to people privately, they acknowledge it as such. But I think there are real reasons for moving forward. Thank you. Um, and I'll have, I have, a, I think, a last question because we're, we're more or less running out of my time. Um, now, so a European ban would in itself not bring the end of Hezbollah. Um, it would be an important step, as you just pointed out. Uh, but let's not be naive. It's not going to make Hezbollah disappear. Um, so from your perspective, what else do you think needs to happen to remove or to counter the state within the state? Uh, that, by the way, that French foreign minister himself um, said that Lebanon is a, is a risk of disappearing. Um, that's, that's how he, he called it. And how, um, from your perspective, um, can Europe and the United States work together on, on making sure that there is a sort of a common strategy to, on the one hand, sort of help uh, Lebanon survive and also really concretely address the issue of, of, of Hezbollah, which is very unique being the state within the state. So let's, uh, let's not beat around the bush. The problem of Hezbollah is a very, very complicated one. And the reason it's so complicated is because the international community has chosen to kind of look the other way and allow Hezbollah over the years. And I'm not talking about decades, really since the 2006 war, to rearm and resupply to the point that it doesn't just threaten Israel to the south or Syrians uh, to the east, uh, but Lebanese themselves, the vast majority of Lebanese who do not support Hezbollah are very, very worried that if they push too far um, with protests or with comments or with laws, that Hezbollah will push back uh, with guns. And we need to be cognizant of that. So what we need to do is try and work from the outside in, because nobody is about to send foreign forces to go and fight. No one's asking for that. Uh, and we need to start by uh, explaining that so long as Hezbollah engages in whatever other activities at the same time as it's engaging in terrorism, international crime and military activities, it's not a legitimate actor and it will be treated as such. Number one, we need to go after their money. Uh, the United States has been doing this uh, quite well going back uh, before the Trump administration. Um, and we need more uh, participation uh, globally. There's a significant element of, of Hezbollah financial activity. And again, this is for their military activities in particular in Europe right now. And it's moved there because Europe has become a more comfortable place uh, as other countries have cracked down, as even places in South America are increasingly designating Hezbollah. There's still criminal activity there, but they're moving in the right direction. So we need to make it more difficult for them to be able to finance the activities they want to do. If they can't pay the salaries of their uh, members and followers, if they can't uh, encourage people to join because of uh, financial incentives. If they can't run their independent country within a country, state within a state, it makes it more difficult for them to do what they want to do. That's not a panacea either, but we have to start moving in the right direction. And we have to start much more vocally supporting the majority of Lebanese, including many Shia, <clears throat> who do not support Hezbollah. That doesn't mean necessarily arming them, but it means showing them that we're with them. And right now, when I speak to Lebanese, they tell me all the time is, you know, we don't get international support. Finally, I'll say we do need much greater transatlantic cooperation on this. And I, I wish the Trump administration uh, had engaged in a more uh, cooperative uh, multilateral uh, approach over the past four years. I've encouraged it to do so. Um, let's not say that the Obama administration before him was doing everything perfectly. There were plenty of things that needed to improve on too. But as we in the United States are nearing uh, an election two weeks from yesterday, it's my hope uh, that whoever next occupies the White House, Trump administration uh, part two or Biden administration, that one of the things that we do is start working in a much more cooperative manner on these issues. Because when we try and strong arm 
our close allies, <clears throat> even on things that we agree on, it's a lot harder to get um, cooperative buy-in. Thank you very much, Matt. I think that last part was particularly important. Um, um, Eric, I think we can now move to the questions uh, from the audience. Yes, we've gotten a lot of good questions. And one of those that have popped up many times is about the election that is only two weeks away. So from your perspective, and without being partisan, how would a Biden approach differ on Hezbollah and more widely Lebanon and Iran from that of President Trump? So, um, yeah, I work in a nonpartisan think tank, so all you're going to get is a nonpartisan answer. Um, there are a small number of things on which there is a bipartisan uh, support uh, in the United States. It really is a small number. Um, one of them is uh, trying to uh, minimize the US military footprint around the world. That's a bipartisan um, desire. A second is to rationalize our counterterrorism strategy more broadly within our um, national security and foreign policy uh, perspective. Um, but one, if you get down into the weeds, is a shared um, interest in holding Iran and Hezbollah's feet to the fire. Um, there are a lot of things I think that the Trump administration has done right when it comes to Hezbollah and Iran. I personally think it was a mistake to pull out of the JCPOA, the Iran deal, for all of its flaws. Uh, and in fact, it was called in um, after the last election during the transition period to brief uh, the Trump transition team on that and argued for holding Iran and its proxies feet to the fire and suggested a number of ways without pulling out of the deal. Because what the pulling out of the deal ended up doing is it ended up um, making us lose some leverage. And if you look at the end of the arms embargo now, the United States has got sanctions in place and we insist that the arms embargo is in there, but no one else in the world agrees with us, which is a problem because there needs to be an arms embargo. I do think that a Biden administration, and I've been speaking to people who are in the Biden uh, uh, circles, uh, would continue to hold Hezbollah's feet to the fire. Uh, they would try and uh, renegotiate some type of deal with Iran, but they're not looking to just you know, snap their fingers and bring the JCPOA back. They recognize things have changed, times have changed, and there were flaws in that deal. Uh, I don't know exactly what will happen uh, with Iran, but the recognition of the need to continue to make it more difficult for Iran to finance its proxies is something that is shared. And whether you like the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign or not, whether you think it's been effective on stopping them from engaging in malign activity, or whether you think it's actually in some ways increased that activity, the fact is it has, it really has made it more difficult for Iran to finance the proxies. Uh, and Hezbollah is hurting because of it, uh, which is one reason Hezbollah is branching out to even more criminal activity, opening the door for more law enforcement activity, which could be still more effective if there were a full ban of Hezbollah. Uh, around the world, including places like, like the European Union. So on this, uh, this is an issue I'm not worried about, uh, whoever next occupies the White House. Um, here in the United States, we have our, our eye on the ball on this larger issue set. Thank you. Another question that has been asked a number of times, how large is Hezbollah's footprint in Lebanese society today? How much has it been weakened by the explosion and the visible and vocal anger from Lebanese civil society? And what motivates people to support Hezbollah today? That is a bundle of excellent, excellent questions. And nobody, certainly not I, can tell you uh, exactly how much support uh, the group has in Lebanon. Um, it does have core supporters who believe that all the things that I've told you about today are malicious lies, some type of American Zionist conspiracy that um, Hezbollah is just defending the downtrodden Shia of Lebanon uh, against foreign conspiracies and fighting against, um, uh, resisting in their terms against uh, foreign occupation, that uh, they haven't engaged in any of the atrocities targeting Sunni Muslims in Syria that people charge, and there's no convincing them. Um, a much larger section of people who are supporters support them because that's what helps them get by, because Hezbollah provides services that they benefit from that the government, because it is both incapable and because it is corrupt, uh, does not provide. Um, and uh, those are people who can be winnowed away. How big that is, I think that fluctuates over time and it's very, very hard to say. What is clear is that among the vast majority of Lebanese, 
whether they are uh, Christian or Sunni or Druze or Shia are people who do not support Hezbollah. But because Hezbollah is the only sectarian group that after the Taif Accords uh, held on to and vastly expanded its military arsenal, they have a uh, trump card that no one else does, which is uh, talking from the end of a barrel of a gun. Um, today, Hezbollah is under more domestic pressure, I believe, than it has ever been. Remember that long before the fall of the Lebanese economy, for which Hezbollah shares a significant, not all, but a significant amount of the blame in particular, not only because they are part and part of the corrupt cronyistic uh, government, but also because of the things they have done more than anyone else to undermine the Lebanese financial system, money laundering and drug trafficking proceeds being funneled into the Lebanese financial system, uh, forcing Lebanese bankers to look the other way when they go illicit banking, threatening their families if they don't. Uh, that's come out in treasury designations, but also because of their political activities. Hezbollah does not want political reform in Lebanon. They want this broken system because they are able to navigate it. They're able to shape it. So do other uh, sectarian parties in Lebanon, but because Lebanon holds the weapon, because Hezbollah, excuse me, holds the weapons, they are de facto the enforcers of this system. They are the ones that by demanding that no reform should be allowed to make them lose control of things like the finance ministry, and you can imagine why they want control of the finance ministry or the health ministry. Um, have undermined efforts of President Macron in particular to uh, stabilize the political system with Lebanon. It's in their interest for them and others to be able to move anything, anyone in and out of uh, Lebanon's various airports and seaports. And that has put tremendous pressure on them. It will not be enough to change the reality there, certainly not at its own, certainly not if the international community doesn't help, but there may be the beginning of something. Thank you. And turning back to Europe, we have a question from Mickey Weinberg in Germany. I'm curious if you could, quote, grade the different European nations, which are most supportive and helpful, and which are the least cooperative in combating Hezbollah's operations. Why do so many European countries still refuse to designate Hezbollah as a terror organization? So uh, the honest answer is I could, but I won't uh, grade them. Uh, I think that would be diplomatic folly. Uh, better to uh, win people over with honey than vinegar. Um, and, but you still need to have an honest and open conversation, uh, which is why I published uh, this report yesterday, uh, specifically focusing on, on France uh, and Hezbollah. Uh, it's not that France or other countries are, are you know, friends of Hezbollah, but they do focus on, in particular because of France's historical, political, cultural relationship with the Levant, Lebanon and Syria in particular, they focus on the issue of stability in Lebanon. They are trying to be realists. Um, and they see that Hezbollah speaks from uh, the end of a gun, the barrel of a gun. Uh, therefore, my, my message to them is, is to focus on things that can help a different, make a difference, maybe at the margins, but make a difference without, you know, under, undermining the whole system and, and leading to a new civil war. And I don't think designation is anywhere near that. You're seeing the beginning of change. You saw Germany uh, uh, engage in a full designation, the United Kingdom, uh, Lithuania, Kosovo, this kind of effort outward in. There have been conversations with a variety of other countries. But I think that France is the sway vote, not only because it's uh, such an important uh, um, party within the European Union, but because other countries, um, Belgium and others, uh, will follow suit. Um, and I think part of the conversation has to be about what are the tangible benefits, and they are tangible, and why are the concerns misplaced? Uh, and forcing officials then to say, in, in those circumstances, why will you not at least do this? I think finally it's important to notice that it, when, when French people in particular, and this week is a painful example of why, think of terrorism, they think of Sunni extremism. If you think about the brutal uh, assassination of, of, uh, of the French uh, teacher, uh, this tragedy. Um, but in fact, uh, there, is other, there are other types of terrorism too, and we need to be able to walk and chew gum. So even though Shia terrorists once upon a time were blowing things up in the streets of Paris as much as they are not today anymore, and they're using instead France and other places in Europe as a cash cow, 
that doesn't mean that, that we shouldn't be taking actions to prevent those activities. They are undermining French interests, breaking French law, and undermining French interests not only at home but abroad as well. Thank you. And a number of questions on the blast itself. Do you believe that the supply of ammonium nitrate hidden under the Beirut port was being used or saved as inventory for terrorism? And was the blast an accident or an attack? So, uh, unfortunately, it's still premature uh, to, uh, to guesstimate. Um, it seems from what authorities are saying so far that this was an accident. Um, and it certainly wasn't an attack from the outside. Um, there's no evidence that I've seen yet that demonstrates that this was ammonium nitrate that was controlled by a terrorist group, Hezbollah or otherwise. This seems to have been something that was part and parcel and unfortunately very typical of the uh, deeply, deeply corrupt system in Lebanon. No one taking responsibility, everybody trying to make a buck off of uh, uh, an opportunity, bribes being paid, trying to sell it off. It, there is some indication that potentially uh, bad actors were trying to get access to some of that ammonium nitrate once it was there. That seems to be why authorities were sent to, um, uh, you know, put a new steel door, uh, which appears to have been at least part of what led to the explosion. It is telling that there was a shipment of ammonium nitrate into the country around the same time, not this shipment, a smaller one, that appears to have been tied to Hezbollah for its use um, stockpiling in Lebanon and use next door in Syria. It's also important to make a distinction between different ammonium nitrate types of plots and types of ammonium nitrate. The international plots that have uh, been revealed, including moving ammonium nitrate through and to France, that involves these ice packs, these, uh, you know, the, the, the disposable ice packs, the two components, you break them and then they get cold for 20 minutes. And if your child sprains their ankle playing, you know, soccer or football, as you call it there, um, half of that is basically, basically ammonium nitrate. That's very different from the military grade, um, uh, explosive grade uh, ammonium nitrate that was found uh, at the Port of Beirut. And we've also now found that this is unfortunately and crazy, but this is something that's happening around the world. And there have been uh, caches of that type of ammonium nitrate sitting in ports in Europe and in, in, in Africa. Uh, people just weren't taking this as seriously as a security risk as they should have. So we need to be uh, we need to be careful about jumping to conclusions. But at a minimum, it shows what was and what wasn't happening at places like the Port of Beirut when we know, as I showed you with Wafik Safa, that Hezbollah, whether they were involved in this particular instance or not, is deeply involved in activity in the Port of Beirut. I, I find it very, very unconvincing for people to assume that Hezbollah had no knowledge that this ammonium nitrate was there. A massive amount of ammonium nitrate in a port where they had this much control and interest. That doesn't mean it was theirs. Doesn't mean they were doing something with it. But it shows how deeply broken the system is, how badly Lebanon needs political reform, security reform, and how nobody is getting in the way of such reform, which is critical for the citizens of Lebanon, more than Hezbollah. Thank you. A question from Randy Hyman. I thought the goal of Hezbollah was to destroy Israel and control Lebanon, but the map depicts so many actions around the world. What other non-Israel related goals motivates Hezbollah? So it's a great question. And to really understand Hezbollah, you have to understand they have multiple goals. And sometimes those goals can be mutually exclusive. You know, when, when, when Hezbollah goes and fights in Syria, it understood that that was going to risk its political standing in Lebanon. And that doesn't mean that it didn't care about its political standing in Lebanon. It absolutely does. Hezbollah is trying to uh, establish itself as the dominant power in Lebanon. Yes. Hezbollah seeks to destroy Israel. Yes. Hezbollah, by its own word, is a key proxy of Iran that subscribes to the principle of waliyat al faqih the rule of the jurisprudence. When the supreme leader of Iran says something should be done, it needs to be done. They are followers of the supreme leader of Iran. They also see themselves as kind of the sharp end of the spear in, de in defense of fellow Shia around the world. And when you put all these things together, it means that they will do things that have nothing to do with Lebanon and nothing to do with Israel 
say, going to help Houthi rebels in Yemen, um, fighting on behalf of the Assad regime in Syria, arguably not completely unrelated to Israel because they want to be able to ship weapons, but really much more having to do with Iran saying, we want you to come and help defend this critical leg in the resistance, as they call it. But a lot of these activities around the world are related to one or more of those goals, illicit finance here, targeting Israeli or American or European interests there. If you dig into the map, you'll see there's lots of different types of activity. Some of the activity doesn't mean that they're trying to do something there. When they sent Ali Karani to Guangzhou, China, they weren't trying to do something in Guangzhou. They saw an opportunity in Guangzhou. There's no evidence the company knew they were negotiating with a guy who was Hezbollah. I'm sure that's not what his business card said. In fact, I know it didn't. He claimed to be uh, working in the medical supply business, which was a lie. Um, so this shows not just where they're operating, but where they are to do, to do something in that location, but where they're operating for their benefit. They recognize that there's a lot of criminal opportunity in South America. So they'll be active there. There's a large Lebanese diaspora there, the vast majority of which is perfectly law-abiding, but it enables bad actors to go and hide in plain sight and take advantage of being within that community. Which is why the map is, is to me anyway, so exciting, because we're finally able to map out the group's different types of activities in different places. And if you use the category section, we've already done your homework for you. And you can see where they're, where have they used fake IDs? Where have they procured that? Where are they procuring weapons? How are they doing that? What kind of illicit finance are they engaged in and where? So we've done that work for you. Eric, maybe you one more question? Sure. So following up on financing, are there ways to ensure that the international funding for the Lebanese state does not get to and is used by Hezbollah? That's really hard. Um, Hezbollah has penetrated the Lebanese state in many ways, but it is not the case. And there are some people who disagree, um, and I would say they have the right to be wrong. It is not the case that the Lebanese state equals Hezbollah. It is the case that the Lebanese state is uh, infiltrated uh, in some places uh, more than others by Hezbollah. But if you look at the um, uh, internal security forces, for example, the ISF, uh, not uh, infiltrated by Hezbollah in any significant way. If you break down the Lebanese armed forces, you can see places where they are or are not infiltrated as much. Um, there are still lots of good actors in Lebanon, including within the state. The bigger problem to me is not where is Hezbollah uh, infiltrated, but the problem of the deep, deep corruption within the country. Uh, the ability for Hezbollah to compromise people, even who don't necessarily like them or want to work with them for ideological purposes, but will work with them if Hezbollah is able to pressure them or if Hezbollah is able to offer them a really sweet deal and, and enrich them. And we see this lots of different times. Look at the recent treasury designation of Mr. Fanunis um, in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, the corruption is the bigger deal, which is why I applauded President Macron's call for humanitarian support for Lebanon, but uh, underscoring that that sh support should not go through the government of Lebanon. It should go through the International Red Cross, it should go through other international organizations, which are also, you know, vulnerable to uh, abuse because they're going to have to work with local Lebanese at some point, but it gives us a little bit more control. One more of the many reasons why we need to see political reform within Lebanon. Thank you so much, Matt. I have one last question, um, which is a little bit of a, of a touchy one uh, before I end it. Um, so um, the United States, both the United States and Europe have actually invested quite a lot in, in, in the Lebanese armed forces. Now, there are some who argue that basically the Lebanese armed forces have been so compromised, so undermined by Hezbollah uh, that basically it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't really work. Um, can you explain to us what is the purpose of further funding the LAF if they are really incapable of, or unwilling to confront Hezbollah? So that's a really great question. Uh, there are two different parts to it, though, that I want to break down. One is what you said at the beginning is the extent to which they are penetrated. And the other is what you said at the very end, the extent to which they are capable and willing. And those are very, very different things. <clears throat> the latter, I have some understanding. If the Lebanese armed forces were to go head to head with Hezbollah, there would be a risk of civil war and there would be a risk that they could lose. 
certainly in any given confrontation. Um, so when we in the West just simply say the Lebanese armed forces should go and do this, it, that, that, might, that, that might be very difficult. We need to have a serious conversation about what we really can and should expect from them. Maybe what kind of support they'd need to do it, but that if they're going to get some types of support, what are the assumptions that, they're, that we're gonna have of their capabilities and their willingness to uh, engage in certain activities? It is not the case that if they were to engage in any activity whatsoever, uh, that it would lead to civil war. As to the issue of their penetration, there have been instances where elements of the LAF have been tied to Hezbollah or have been compromised by Hezbollah or have been bribed by Hezbollah. That is going to happen. It doesn't mean that the entirety of the LAF uh, is uh, compromised by Hezbollah. And the reality is that the only glue that holds this deeply, deeply divided community uh, of Lebanon together is uh, in many ways uh, the Lebanese armed forces. It's the only element where there are members of every confessional group. Um, and, uh, and there's something to be said for that. I don't think that that alone should mean that it is doing just fine and we should treat it as is. I think there have to be caveats and conditions for our aid. We have to think about what type of aid and there is, it is true that the LAF could and should and should be expected to do more. But if you want to ask Lebanese to do more in this context, you must show that you have their back. And when the European Union plays this silly game that even Hezbollah says is a farce, that there's a good side to Hezbollah and a bad side to Hezbollah, the takeaway for all those Lebanese who want to do something is you don't have our back, but you want us to go and face Hezbollah gun to gun. So we have to do our part, and then we can ask them to do theirs. And I do think the LAF could and should play a role in that. Very important point. Um, thank you so much, Matt. I could um, talk for, to you for, for hours, but uh, we'll do that next time you come back to Paris. Uh, it was really my honor <laughs> hosting us, hosting you today. Uh, I would like to thank you um, for really having, having taken the time. I know how busy you are uh, to sit down with us, to discuss those key issues with us. Um, at a really particular timely moment, I would say, uh, for Lebanon, for Europe, uh, for, for the rest of the region. I also hope that for those of you who watched us, uh, I know that there are several diplomats in, from, from Europe who are watching us, uh, that you found this uh, at least informative uh, and possibly more, uh, that you have found arguments uh, to hopefully um, um, push the issue uh, forward. Um, for the sake of Europe, for the sake uh, of Lebanon. And I would urge all of you once again to have a look at uh, both the map on the Washington Institute's uh, website, as well as look at the ad that was just published today at the Wall Street Journal that AJC just published on uh, the issue of Hezbollah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everybody. Be safe, be healthy. So I would like to thank our global audience for joining us today. If you enjoyed this program, please consider making a donation to AJC at ajc.org slash donate. Our next AJC Advocacy Anywhere program will take place tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Central European Time, and will feature a timely debate on the Jewish vote in America. For more information and to register, please visit ajc.org slash advocacy anywhere. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.